In episode four, they lay to rest Baza. At the funeral, Gully shows up, but Alfie knows that he's not just paying his respects. Gully's always hated funerals, and he's never been one to take no for an answer. So he knows that Gully's just there to try to get employees for this job. And while Alfie doesn't want to rob anybody, he also knows that he has no money and he's down a guy. So he's in between a rock and a hard place, and he agrees to work for Gully this one time. The next night, he wakes up in the middle of the night and heads to do this job. And the job is to get the mayor's vehicle stopped so they can ambush it. But when they go inside, there's no money. There's no gold. There's nothing. Gully starts asking the mayor where it is, but then Alfie takes over, beating the crap out of the mayor and really showing a mean streak that we haven't seen before. But it's a lot of pent-up frustration from the last few days. Even though Dave Boy and Gully tell him to chill out because the guy can't tell him where the gold is if he's dead, this beating does elicit an admission of where they can find it. To celebrate, everybody then heads to Alfie's club and they start popping bottles of champagne. One of those people is Mrs. Troy, and she's still giving those F me eyes to Alfie. But one of Gully's usual guys starts openly talking about the fact that they got this money from robbing somebody. And that doesn't sit well with Alfie because he doesn't want anybody knowing about it. He's kind of ashamed of the fact that he had to resort to this. But that really insults Gully's crew because it makes it look like Alfie thinks he's better than him. It starts a little bit of a fight, and Mrs. Troy gets sick of watching it, so she gets up to leave, but Gully says no. You leave when I say you can leave. And she tells him to go F himself. To which he responds by backslapping the crap out of her. He goes to do it again, but Alfie stops him and tells him, You don't do that here. If you want to beat your wife, you do it at your place. Gully and Alfie then have a chat privately. At first, it's a big pissing contest. The pissing contest leads to both of them holding each other at knife point. But when cooler heads prevail, Alfie tells Gully, That's it, I'm done. I don't really like this lifestyle doesn't really agree with me but gully has one more final job it's a big one he needs alfie he needs him by his side so he asks him to come back and alfie tells him i'll think about it alfie then heads downstairs and tells the barkeeper to call last round and as he's hanging out by himself mrs troy walks up to him she tells alfie tell gully that i'll be waiting for him outside and then she thanks him for stepping in and alfie's response to that is to aggressively make out with her She absolutely 1,000% kisses him back, but she also stops herself, slaps Alfie, and tells him, I'm not sure if you're brave or stupid. And he tells her, both. Now, the war is still raging on, but it hasn't been the rousing success that Hardwood would have liked. They've been trying to make inroads, but it hasn't really bared fruit. One thing they could do is artillery strikes on London, because if London falls, then all of it falls. But what's the point of destroying a city if you actually want to take it? And there is one way that they don't have to destroy the city, but they also could win the war, and that's Stormcloud. But Francis Gaunt says, I'm not having that. And Harwood reminds her that she's not in charge. This results in him screaming at Francis, kicking her out of the room. And with just him and Salt, it gives Harwood a little bit of time to decompress. And he does ask Salt, what's the latest with Bet Sykes? But Salt lies to him and tells him, she disappeared. We're trying to find her. In reality, he tried to kill her. But Bet Sykes is alive and well. She's made it to London, hitching a ride, and now she just has to find her sister. And the thing is, she's not worried one bit that she's in league territory. Katie, on the other hand, is thrilled to be back, because in league territory, she feels comfortable. But neither of them feel great when they go to the address of Peggy Sykes, and it's all boarded up, looks abandoned, and they don't really know what to do. With nowhere else to go, they end up sleeping on the street that night. The next day when they wake up, Katie suggests that they split up looking for Peggy. But all Bet heard was split up. She feels like she has to protect Katie, but Katie reminds her, we're in league territory, I'm fine. And that's when Bet reminds her that being in league territory doesn't mean that she's safe. But Katie says, I I know that, but what use to you am I? And Bet yells at her, what about moral support? I mean, I thought we were friends. And when Katie says, yeah, no, we are, I mean, kind of, Bet takes true offense to it. But these two women have been traveling alone for a little bit now. And one of the reasons why Katie said kind of is because Bet won't open up. She won't talk about her past. And when Katie prods again, Bet just walks away. She heads to a phone booth, but right behind her is Katie, following her with that moral support. And as luck would have it, they find out where Peggy is. She's running her own sex shop. 
So finally, Bet is able to link back up with Peggy, and the two sisters are back together. And then finally, there's Thomas Wayne, who goes to visit Martha Kane. He knows that Martha doesn't want to talk to him, but he's in a dilemma. He's got a party to attend to for his sister, and his sister has found a new boyfriend that he hates. He's a fashion designer who has a very checkered past, like sleeping with 13-year-olds checkered past. So Thomas tells Martha this entire backstory of why he needs her, but it turns out Martha's already headed to the party. Patricia invited her. And right before Martha leaves her apartment, she tells Thomas, Patricia's going to be the only Wayne I'll be talking to. Although, that's a complete lie. When Thomas finally shows up at this party, Martha is already talking to Patricia and her new guy, Jacques. The four of them start making casual conversation, but Jacques is putting down Martha and her fashion sense. He even goes so far as to give Martha his card, saying, I can help you out, you gotta give me a call. And when Jacques and Patricia finally walk away, Martha ends up talking to Thomas and telling him, yeah, you're right, that guy sucks. They think this is one of Patricia's normal boyfriends that she'll be done with in a little bit, but then they look over the dance floor, and Jacques has proposed to Patricia. So now the group needs to formulate a plan to get rid of this guy, and the plan they come up with is to have Martha call Jacques up and say, you're right, I do need your help. But when he gets over there, she's going to try to seduce him, and then Thomas is going to come over with Patricia, Patricia's going to see her guy with Martha, she's going to know that he's not loyal, and then she's going to dump him. So in order to kill time after the party, Thomas and Patricia head to the club. Martha ends up calling Jacques up, and it's working great. I mean, Jacques ends up stripping down to nothing. The problem is, Thomas and Patricia are taking forever to come back from the club. But when they finally walk into the apartment, there's Martha, fine, and then there's Jacques, tied up naked on the ground, and that's when Patricia knows that her guy isn't really loyal. She ends up chasing him down the streets of London, naked, screaming at him about what a scumbag he is. That leaves Martha and Thomas to celebrate their win, but all the bad blood that was built up over what happened to the Archbishop is seemingly gone, because the excitement of that night ends up leading to the excitement in the bedroom. Thomas Wayne and Martha Kane finally hook up. But while all of that was going on, the Raven Union is hard at work to try to win this war. Francis Gone has got information that the League has elected a new Prime Minister, and it's Aziz. And that name definitely is familiar to Hardwood because he remembers Aziz being the one to torture him back in the tower. Hardwood then apologized to Francis for how he acted. And Francis accepts the apology because she knows that he's in a fragile state. Health-wise, he's doing horribly. She tells him, if you were a sailor, I'd say you have scurvy. You really got to take care of yourself. The conversation then segues into Storm Cloud. And Hardwood tells her, look, that is a last resort. But Hardwood at this point doesn't know what to do because the League isn't giving in, even though they've basically lost. And Francis suggests that maybe Aziz being the Prime Minister could help them. Maybe they could do business with him. But doing business with Aziz is something that Hardwood has zero interest in. He then mentions how he wishes Bet and Peggy were there because they always cheer him up. And then he starts getting a little disoriented. He completely forgets about what they were even talking about. It's like Francis Gaunt was having a conversation with two different people. She leaves the room and runs in assault. And it's ironic that he walks up to her after this just happened because he's been concerned about Hardwood's state of mind for a while now. But even after what she just saw, she comes to his defense, saying that Salt is dangerously close to being disloyal. So Salt gently approaches Francis with the same thing that she just told Hardwood. Go to Aziz. Maybe through an intermediary, he might listen to reason. But Aziz is already hard at work at trying to win this war. He's been able to put a spy in the Raven Union, and that spy goes to look at a display of Storm Cloud. He opens up a curtain, and there's a bunch of guys walking around in a square, and when he presses a button, a cloud rushes over the square, completely covering them. They have no idea what happened until suddenly, one of the individuals smashes up against the glass, and they're clearly dying a painful death. Salt tells the group that within five minutes, that square could be clear, and it'll be safe enough for children to play in. Aziz's spy is mortified, but Hardwood, he's so impressed that he stands up and gives it a standing ovation. Because the way he looks at it, this is going to win him the war. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel and subscribing to my Patreon. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. If you left a comment, I don't get back to you. I usually don't check the comments unless they're like a super comment. Also, if you don't see the next video up on the end screen, not to worry. It'll be up in a day or two.